scientists both in biology and in physical sciences to look at the ocean. And in 1902, uh, the University of Kiel formed the International Laboratory of Marine Science. And in 1903, University of California formed the uh, Marine Biological Laboratory at San Diego. And of the, from those two laboratories formed by universities interested not only in marine biology, but the, the interplay between biology and the physical world around it. And also, both institutions from the beginning uh, articulated the need to make those observations long term. And that, that persistent observation of the ocean to be able to not only define it as it was, but understand how it changes with time has been in the DNA of the two institutions ever since. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, my, my own uh, first interactions uh, with the University at Kiel uh, were still when it was the Institute for Miraskunda, and uh, I came to it from the perspective of paleoceanography, and of course worked with the great Michael Sarntein, and then later Joran Tita, who was the first director of Geomar. Uh, so out of, uh, and uh, uh, Peter Domenico isn't here yet, but he's in the second uh, session, but he too is a paleoceanographer, paleoclimatologist, and we used to say that we were sort of the ultimate time series observation of the ocean. Uh, but I think that uh, it, it's really then so appropriate that, uh, that we co-host this, uh, this look at ocean observation and ocean sustainability. So with that uh, brief introduction, I'd like to uh, start introducing the, the first panel for today. And uh, our first speaker is Tasta Tanhua uh, from Geomar, uh, Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research, Kiel in Germany. He is the co-chair of the Global Ocean Observing System, GOOSE. Uh, he's a chemical oceanographer and uh, his research focuses on ocean transient tracers and ocean observing systems. He's also the coordinator of the EU project EUROSEA, which aims at improving the ocean observing and forecast system. Tasta. So I have a presentation. Do I press here? Oh, there we go. Yes. No, I have to do one more. Well, I think this is oh, maybe it's the wrong presentation. But anyway, let me just start to introduce myself. Uh, Margaret did a great job. So for me, this is this is uh, epic in a way because I, after my PhD in Göteborg at the Institute of Chemistry, doing a PhD in marine chemistry, I did a postdoc at Scripps for three years around the turn of the century, and that really shaped my whole career, being an institute where we have the whole breadth of all marine science disciplines, working with Professor Wise and doing transient traces, which has followed me around my whole career. Um, and now, I can say that transient traces is an essential ocean variable and an essential climate variable, so we have a little bit of a mandate to keep going with transient tracers. But I want to talk to you about GOOSE, which is a permanent program to coordinate and support international cooperation for a sustained ocean observing system. So what is GOOSE? Well, it is this program um, for coordinating and, and a functioning of the long-term sustained observing system. It's really about cooperation across nations, across scales, and across different variables. <clears throat> so GOOSE has been around since 1991, so we have a 30-year-plus history. The focus of GOOSE in the beginning was on climate and open ocean, but with the, with the strategy and the framework of ocean observing for, for the framework was about 10 years ago, we have now a much broader portfolio. So we cannot have an efficient climate policy 
without observations. Basically, we cannot manage what we cannot measure. So we really need an observing system that feeds into data management and product generation. Um, what happened? Okay, that's fine. And so we are looking at various things of the ocean observing system for sustainable development. One of them is carbon. The ocean is taking up huge amounts of carbon. We're talking about 12 billion tons of carbon dioxide and you know, we have a carbon dioxide price of $100 that will be about a trillion euros a year. Uh, so we need to manage that. We need to assess the efficiency of the carbon sink, particularly when we go forward in time and have a, a reduced, hopefully reduced CO2 emissions scenario, which will fundamentally change the, the physics and chemistry of carbon uptake. We're looking at cyclone forecasting. We really need to know the top 50 meters of the water column, the temperature, to be able to, to track and predict uh, track and intensity of, of uh, cyclones. We're looking at the marine resources. We're looking at uh, storm surge prevention, heat waves. It's a major issue these days. So these are all things that we can provide services to society by having an efficient, coordinated ocean observing system. So I mentioned the framework of ocean observing that came out of the conference in 90, well, 2009. And this has really formed GOOS. We're looking at that value chain about setting the requirements, what to observe and how to observe it and what are the questions that we're asking. And then we go into that pink box where we're looking at different methods to observe these essential ocean variables. We have ships and we have gliders and floats and all these kind of things and we're getting more and more new technology. It fits into a data management system and product generation. And ideally, there's a feedback loop coming back to the first question, how well are we actually able to, to respond to that first question. And the lower graph here is a different way of looking at that value chain from the Goose 2030 strategy. So we have the inputs, the requirements, we have the, uh, the processes, so actually making the observations. We have the outputs, which are then the data products and then impact, really want to get impact. And you see that snaky curve is kind of snaking back towards the requirement setting again. <clears throat> and the readiness level concept is something that is very common to use these days, but I think it was for the ocean observing community a new concept when it came out more than 10 years ago. So Ocean Ops, former Jacom Ops, is tracking the ocean observing system. And you can see this map that they are producing, and, and Matthew Bellbock is sitting here in the audience, is leading that entity of Goose. So these are all entities or assets in the water. It looks like they're full of assets, but really each of these dots is corresponding to many square kilometers of ocean space, and many of these dots are lines or things that are repeated every 10 years and so on. So we are not doing as well as we, we would need. And there is a quote here from Lars Peter Richard God in WMO, really stating that if you don't have data from the ocean, even the weather models are going to go astray. So this is a little bit about how we are set up here. We have a scientific oversight and steering committee. We're looking at three panels on biogeochemistry, biology ecosystems, and, and physics, where the experts in these essential ocean variables are, are, are uh, guiding the development of the observing system. Then we have the coordination of, of the actual observations, so, and that is what I just told you about the ocean ops. And we have projects, so we are developing the observing system for different projects. Atlantis is one, TIPO, so we're going to hear from the deep ocean observing strategy maybe. Uh, and we have a school that's going to define itself by delivering on free societal benefit areas climate services, operational forecasting, and ocean health. And I mentioned the essential ocean variable that provides the framework around what, how GOOSE is operating. So we really need to have observations of all these variables for different purposes. And this has been selected in the long process with the community based on, on the feasibility versus impact spectra. Some of them are important for climate, some are more important for 
Ocean Health and so on. Uh, and if you go to the website, you will find specification sheets that tells you a little bit more on how you can observe them and what the spatial, temporal resolution is that you need and accuracy and all that kind of details. So I mentioned a strategy. So it came out in 2020. Uh, I think we presented that at the first Ocean Decade conference in Copenhagen. And you can see that we have 11 strategic objectives where we want to move forward. Um, the green box in the, in the top there is about the core of GOES, system integration and delivery. It's about data, it's about design, it's about operational tracking. Uh, we have the deep engagement and impact, so we need to strengthen partnerships. That is really key for the new strategy. We need partnership along the whole value chain. There's no point in just making all observations if that doesn't lead in the end to some impact. Uh, so we want to be able to evaluate the impact, we want to do advocacy, and we want to empower end-user applications. And to the right here, we have building for the future, so we are supporting innovation very much together with the Oceanographic Institutes like GOR and uh, Scripps, and, and POGO in particular. Uh, guide capacity development also together with POGO. Observe human impacts. We have a great breakout session on Wednesday where we talked about IMDOS, the Integrated Marine Debris Observing System, and that is coming along very well. That together with Ocean Sun are new essential ocean variables. And we're all looking at governance for the observing system. And Margaret mentioned that I'm coordinating the EURACI project, and we have a vision that is very similar to the one on GOOS. And EURACI is really about ocean observing and forecasting. And we have about one year and a half to go on that project. And uh, I'm very thankful for the commission to have funded that project. Uh, in the decade, Goose is leading and taking the responsibility for three of the endorsed programs. Ocean Observing Co-Design, one key program, where it's about co-designing the observing system, not just with the end users, but also with the modeling community and make sure that we have a, a, a co-design process for that, developing that. Course predict, very important to be able to take down observations and, and, and services to the closer scale, what really matters for people, closer cities and so on. And observing together where we're looking at uh, the communities in, in around the world to be able to support the observations. So this is a little bit of our push from, from, from Goose here. Um, we are looking at a fundamental step change in the way that we do ocean observing. We want to have a big lift, and we're looking at something like the International Space Station, where many countries can come together and invest in a common entity for science. So let's do the same for ocean observing. Let's integrate, let's move a little bit away from your individual grant, your individual research project towards a common good, of providing society with the ocean data that we need. So let's build the International Ocean Observatory together. So i stop there, thank you. Thank you, Tosta. We're going to have presentations from all of the panel members and then have uh, Q&A after that. Um, and, and thanks for that call for the, uh, the uh, like the International Space Station. Um, our next speaker is uh, Lisa Levin. Lisa Levin is a distinguished professor of biological oceanography at Scripps Oceanography. And she is a marine ecologist who studies uh, benthic ecosystems in the deep sea and the shallow water. Uh, I think um, many here in this room know her primarily for her work on the deep sea. And uh, she is the founder and co-lead of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, DOSI, which seeks to integrate science uh, together with technology, policy, law, 
and economics to advise on ecosystem-based management of resources in the deep ocean and strategies to maintain the integrity of deep ocean ecosystems. Uh, she is also uh, very much involved in, uh, helped establish and co-leads the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy, DEUCE, uh, which is, as you heard, a program of uh, the Global Ocean Observing System. And uh, in 2019, won the Prince Albert I Grand Medal in Ocean Science. Lisa? Okay, I, um, I'm hoping they'll put my presentation up. There we go. Um, so, hello everybody. Uh, today I would like to talk, basically make the case for why we need to do observing in the deep ocean and talk to you about the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. This is a picture of the submersible Alvin greeting a, a resident of the deep ocean there. So I think most of you in this room know that um, we're an ocean planet and that the deep sea, uh, which we define as being below 200 meters, covers over half this planet, about two thirds. And um, what people may not realize, let's go back, is that our exclusive economic zones are in fact mostly deep ocean. 75% of them have um, area or I should say 75% of all exclusive economic zones uh, territory is below 200 meters. And, and for island nations, I think this percentage is much larger. Most island nations are in fact deep ocean, not just big ocean nations, but deep ocean nations. So I put this black slide up because this is what people used to think about the deep sea, you know, that it was dark and that there wasn't anything there. Um, but we know there's a lot there. We also now know that the deep sea is not one thing, right? You often hear it referred to as one realm, but in fact, we understand that it is a huge range of ecosystems, some that we're still discovering. So we found low oxygen zones and uh, tens of thousands of seamounts and thousands of canyons. We found flat abyssal plains and trenches. We found chemosynthetic ecosystems, methane seeps and hydrothermal vents. We found biogenic reefs that extend for many kilometers. Um, and of course, the vast deep pelagic. Mo most of these systems aren't very well explored, but the little we know tells us that each one of these has their own set of species. Thus, the biodiversity of the deep sea is huge. But as we explore these, we've also come to understand they hold resources that are of quite uh, increasing interest to uh, humans and society. So for example, oxygen minimum zones sequester phosphorus, phosphorites, and we're interested in mining these for fertilizer. Um, we have found um, many metals that people are interested in, in abyssal plains, in the, in the polymetallic nodules, in the massive sulfides at hydrothermal vents, in, in the cobalt crusts at seamounts. We've come to understand there's a lot of oil and gas in canyons accumulated organic matter over many millions of years and we're extracting that. And there are aggregations of fishes that we are harvesting um, near seamounts, near cold water uh, coral reefs and uh, some of the, these fish even aggregate at methane seeps. And uh, let me go back, well, what happened here? I just, they just changed mode on me, that's okay. And we're, we're actually looking at a new fishery, harvesting mesopelagic fishes from the midwater. These are the fish that migrate up and down vertically every day. So there are, uh, and we've come, as we explore these systems, we've come to understand and, uh, that there are many imperatives for observing um, to better understand the ocean's role, the deep ocean's role in climate regulation, the potential for climate mitigation, biomimicry, foods, medicines, energy, you can read this list. It's, it's in fact very long and, and growing almost every year. Um, we need, we definitely need to know more about the deep ocean. We need observing for sustainable management, for conservation, and for safety of human populations. So here I've illustrated some of, of the motivators. You know, for designing of marine protected areas, we really need 
deep ocean observing data, for managing contaminants, um, which is increasingly a problem, for managing our deep ocean fisheries, um, for managing climate engineering, should we get to that point of almost all of the ocean-based climate interventions that have been proposed will affect the deep ocean, and we need observations to understand how to manage those. For our, our deep water energy industries, um, deep water oil and gas, and then hopefully more offshore wind. Again, we need deep ocean observations to know about siting and impacts. And for early warning systems and uh, coping with hazards, we definitely need um, deep observations. We are at a place where we actually risk destruction of deep sea diversity before we discover and understand it. And uh, so biological uh, observations in particular are increasingly important. We know the ocean has critical roles um, as what we call regulating services. It takes up huge amounts of heat. Uh, from the atmosphere, and some of it, and much of it ends up below, below 200 meters, most maybe. Um, we know the ocean provides carbon services, removing, transporting, transforming, and burying carbon. And so we are, start, are starting to think about these deep ocean ecosystems as a, in a different way, uh, valuing them for the transport of carbon or for the high rates of carbon sequestration that we have on continental margins, or for the vast areas of carbon removal that happen in the abyssal plains, or for the sequestration of carbon in animal biomass, or for the filtration of methane that happens at methane seeps. Some of that methane is turned into carbonate or oxidized by microbes before it gets into the atmosphere. And we understand vents are really important in fertilizing the ocean and contributing to primary productivity. So we now know of these very critical deep ocean services, but these services and the biodiversity that provides them are increasingly under threat from deep uh, I'm sorry, from bottom trawling and, the, and from bycatch, from an, uh, energy extraction, from contaminants, from disposal of waste, including our terrestrial mine tailings, and potentially from seabed mining. So, um, and the reason this is, uh, I, I'm bringing up these threats is we desperately need observations and data information to help us guide the management of these industries. Some are nascent, some are ongoing, um, but we, we cannot do enough to um, address the different kinds of disturbances. We know there'll be altered substrates, altered physics, altered suspended sediments, different chemicals, changes in food webs and structures, and um, oxygen consumption and so on. So our observing systems can contribute to the management and, um, and accompany conservation for all of this. So this brings me to the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy, which is an international community-based network of networks that coordinates um, observing to understand the state of the global deep ocean, its baseline consistent conditions, its responses to climate change, and its responses to human disturbance. And, um, one of the key elements uh, has the, that uh, DEUCE focuses on is the central ocean variables, which Taste mentioned, and many of these variables, we are looking at uh, the specs needed for the deep ocean, and even whether there might need to be some new deep ocean variables, so we've been working on those in the realm of physics, biogeochemistry, and biology. Um, I should point out, as a network of networks, we have involved many, many kinds of observing, so moorings and uh, CTD casts, but autonomous underwater vehicles, and uh, submersibles, and observatories, and landers, and even animal-based sensors, all of this um, all of these tools are available for monitoring the deep ocean. So this is DEUCE in a single slide. We have three, element, uh, th three basic themes, requirement setting, which involves not just looking at EOVs, but establishing best practices for the deep ocean, observational gaps, and in particular, bringing together the modeling and observing and exploration communities. We have an implementation group, um, and they focus on technology, advancement, development, and readiness. And uh, 
and imp implementing these initially in three demonstration project areas, the Azores, the Clarion Clipperton Zone in the Northeast Pacific, and then the third um, group in induces science translation, and we are working on capacity development, but also bringing do science to management and policy. And I think we're at a really critical time uh, in development of deep sea policy and deciding what we're going to do with our deep ocean. You've heard a lot about it at this meeting. Um, we have a big challenge as to how to put our knowledge to work to enable sustainability in the deep ocean. I've listed some of the realms here that need to come together, but there are, of course, many more. I think that we um, deep ocean observing will be really critical to informing sustainability, help, uh, and we need to work together to decide where to make new deep ocean observations, what to measure, how to do effective spatial planning in the deep ocean, how to improve our environmental impact assessments and our models, and what new research directions we should address, especially those that address the needs of people. And I hope we're going to hear more about some of those needs uh, later in our session. So thank you very, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lisa. I'd like to pause for a minute and before we go to our next speaker and sort of call our attention to the special experience that we have, that we as scientists have at a conference like this, being able to listen to the elected and appointed representatives of governments about the ocean. And I think that one of the strong messages that comes out of, the, uh, out of being here is hearing how much they appreciate the science, but how much they want us to adapt our uh, observing and adapt our science to the needs uh, of, uh, of those nations. And especially as we talk about observing, to, uh, to also include, and I, this is definitely something that, that uh, Goose has been focused on, including observations that are critical to the economies of the developing world and the, as we call it, the big ocean states now. And I think that uh, those of us who look at, the, at Goose and, and uh, talk about its great achievements in terms of understanding the ocean, uh, need to uh, own that piece that, that we're going to, we need the support uh, of the countries who want us to understand that for their economies and sustainability. And so I, I think that that's a really strong message that I felt here and that I've, I've felt at COPS as well. So with that, uh, we're going to turn to uh, Corinne, or is it Corinna? Corinne? Corinne. Corinne Almeida. Uh, she is a professor of biological oceanography at Universidade Tecnico do Atlantico, uh, so Atlantic Technical University. And she's currently the director of the master's program in climate change and marine science. And her research is, focuses on ecology and conservation of coral communities in marine protected areas. And she's also very interested in coastal oceanography and the interaction between environmental uh, factors in these ecosystems. Corinne. Good morning. And thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, so maybe some of you uh, will be asking with the development of this presentation, uh, what we are doing here in a panel uh, dedicated, focused mostly in ocean observation, presenting a, gra uh, a graduate school. Uh, 
in uh, West Africa, more precisely in Cape Verde. So as uh, uh, I guess it is not uh, new for anyone here that there is uh, a lack in ocean observation in the, in the tropical region and especially in the in Africa continent and most particularly in the West African region. And this lack is not just a lack in ocean observation, but including the marine science. There are just very few schools in marine science, so that may the dedicate to for capacity building in order that we can uh, manage to to have in the near future uh, good experience in ocean observation, how has been showed uh, showed here. Uh, so. Uh, our, uh, I forgot that I have this. Okay, so um, as was mentioned, uh, we have a graduate school that uh, on marine science and climate change that is being done uh, under the umbrella of WASCAL, that is West, uh, West uh, African Science Center on Climate Change and Adapted uh, Land Use, that is an organization uh, implemented in 11 West African countries and founded mainly by the Federal Ministry of, uh, German Federal Ministry of uh, Education and Research. Um, so our uh, school start uh, in 2019 uh, with the huge collaboration of uh, Guillomar. So thank you very much and uh, my thanks especially to Bjorn that uh, uh, is, uh, is our daily partner uh, uh, during this, uh, this last uh, three, four, uh, four to five years. Uh, so this, uh, the school, as I mentioned, is a huge partnership that includes uh, the Institute of Engineering and Marine Science at the Atlantic Technical University, uh, the Guillomar, the OSM, the Ocean Science Center in Mindelo, also a partnership between Guillomar and another institution, the IMAR in Cape Verde and Tunian Institutes. Uh, so um, until now, since 2019, uh, we have uh, received several students until now, so, so three, three batches. One graduated last uh, December, another one is uh, close to, to, to finalize uh, now in between July to, to se September, and we have a third, uh, a third batch. Besides the, the, the challenge of being started just uh, close to the pandemic crisis, but we was able to, to, to move on. And especially because we have a huge network, not just in terms of institutions, but in terms of uh, researchers uh, from European countries, uh, Germany, Portugal, uh, France, uh, uh, West African countries, especially Benin and Nigeria from Brazil. So this huge network uh, that uh, we are establishing uh, and developing, involving all these uh, West African students can, can be uh, uh, proficuous for the development a network of ocean observation in West, uh, in West Africa. So is that our proposal here? Uh, in order, how was uh, mentioned, uh, uh, the goose is a uh, cooperation between, uh, between countries, uh, but uh, uh, I guess uh, still uh, have uh, more opportunities and needs to include more uh, the West African region. I'm speaking particularly about West African region, but also I guess there is lags in other regions, especially related to the to the city and the tropical tropical region. I will let you uh, hear I, I, just to pay uh, attention to a, a, another point. So along the the time the the years, uh, we also take care to. In, in, to include more women. Uh, so we just did a small uh, positive discrimination in order that, uh, um, that we get more women or the, 
to have the gender balance in our uh, master program. Because we realized in the first years that usually we have the, the girls in the third, uh, first, uh, third, second position, and uh, so for that we uh, we did this discrimination to, to, to balance because we know that this usually the position they got is more related with some cultural issues uh, that uh, put them in the position to have uh, less opportunities. So it's a training that is most, uh, uh, so we focus in, uh, especially in practical uh, training. And here, just to show you this uh, video, uh, with that also with collaboration of uh, Germany was able to have this first floating university. Thank you very much. A part of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. We're a group of students from 12 West African countries who are training to become real ocean scientists. The scientists on board introduced us to the scientific equipment you need to get your samples. For example, we learned from Tim and Andreas how probably the most important oceanographic instrument called the CTD is deployed. The CTD measures temperature, salinity and depth as it is lowered down into the ocean. When you are studying ocean science, it is crucial that you not only talk about the ocean, you want to be close to it and work with it. Many of us joined this master's program because it gives us the opportunity to take part in a real research expedition. We have read enough literature about it. We really learn something about uh, oceanography and during this cruise. Yes, if uh, we were not able to come, I will just say we are half oceanographers, uh, oceanograph uh, scientists, but now we are complete. It will. It is good for me because I learn how to manage, uh, how to manage a team, how to coordinate uh, work with the team, and uh, when you are working with the team, also it's help you to improve yourself. So you can see that the Waska Floating University has taught us in many ways. The new experiences have broadened our horizon. We want to make a difference. We want to tackle the problems our planet is facing. Climate change is affecting everybody and it, it, it is a, a real problem for us and if we want to do something to protect our environment and uh, manage it sustainably, we need to, to, to work, we need to study, we need to do research. Today, we finished our last sampling station successfully. We can say that we are proud of our achievements and of the crew of MSM 106. So, let's see what the future will bring for us. There's no time to relax. Everyone has to work. That was wonderful. I was remembering my first oceanographic cruise, and uh, that that um, you know what, whatever subject it was oriented around, uh, seeing how hard it was to get samples and uh, seeing that first experience of uh, okay, I'm going to be an oceanographer. Uh, I am com I am complete, as your colleague said. That was great. So next, uh, we're turning to Leopoldo Cavalieri Gerhardinger, uh, who is a research fellow coordinator and ESG representative in the Early Career Researcher Network of Networks at University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, he works on topics ranging from marine ecology and ethnoecology to most recently the theory and practice of ocean governance beyond academe. Uh, he's also very actively involved in building knowledge networks across coastal Brazil using web-based social media tools and cross-disciplinary facilitation approaches. 
and uh, he is the coordinator of the Earth System Governments, Governance Project uh, Research Fellows Network in Latin America and a member of the Executive Secretary of the Brazilian Future Ocean Panel an advisor on marine spatial planning to the secretary of the Brazilian Interministerial Commission on Sea Resources. Thank you, Leopoldo. Hello everyone, good morning. So we're starting with some good news. I've moved now to uh, University, Autonomous University of Barcelona with ICTA. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to contribute with this uh, exciting session. And um, I want to share a few examples uh, on how can we include the human dimension, human interactions in ocean observations. Uh, I think it's a, a topic that deserves a lot of our attention. So, yeah, we are all aware of the need to sustainability science to confront the complex challenges of ocean governance in the Anthropocene, for instance. Like, how to, do we respond to blue acceleration? A major question remains, though, how to engage us in citizens' knowledge um, and bridge the divide that exists currently among the visions of uh, blue economy, for instance, and visions of blue justice coming from less uh, powerful agents such as small-scale fishers, fishers. For instance, the small-scale fishers and fish workers' major contributions to sustainable ocean development starkly contrast with their continued marginalization in decision-making. And uh, I will argue that networks, marine learning networks, in the interfaces of blue economy and blue justice movements and other um, ocean uh, citizens uh, knowledge uh, movements uh, may create this sort of bridges in pathways to ocean sustainability. So, uh, study cases from Brazil. Uh, this is a huge ocean area, um, which the Brazilian Navy calls the Blue Amazon, and um, civil society organizations are usually not able to um, advocate for ocean, the NGOs and social movements, because Brasilia, our capital, is very far from the coast, uh, so it, this sometimes we think it was done for purpose because it's very very difficult for civil society in general to be able to influence federal level policy where the decisions are made. So um, the, we we wanted to de design a program that could address this sort of uh, issue. And the first example here is the Brazilian Ocean Horizon, four-year program which builds capacities around ocean governance system change by enabling leadership of early career ocean professionals to flourish, their leadership to flourish in, a, in the interfaces of on the ocean knowledge and policy. So we ask ourselves, can one be a catalyst and create help, create acceleration in transitions to inclusive and ocean and ecosystem-based ocean governance? So the program revolves around yearly internetwork seminars where participants from different networks come together online and in person to jointly design action research plans. So to envision activities that will be co-produced each year. So participants produce uh, in generally um, policy briefs, social media strategies, using podcasts, videos, webinars, original research articles. Uh, we've come up with an online course on advo ocean advocacy and also to do uh, actually go to Brasilia and experience in-person advocacy where they can hold state agents accountable for critical issues in ocean governance. So since 2019, we have been, uh, we've been working with uh, eight action research teams on different topics from marine spatial planning to sustainable fisheries to environmental justice and other topics. So this is us in action. I'll talk about a little bit more about this methodology that we use to organize our networks and how we uh, come together to mobilize, create community. So with this another example here. So the second example illustrates the application of participatory network mapping methods to explore federal government's authorities' perception about the blue economy agenda in Brazil. So we made 12 focal groups sessions with high-level authorities, government informants, um, to build a participatory network map in each focal group about how they envision the marine spatial planning arena now and into the future. So each session firstly discussed the group's vision for the blue economy and then we asked them to enlist 
what in their perceptions are the most important actors, their relationships, and how power is distributed in that network in the Murray Spatial Planning Arena they are part of. So we uh, just published this paper, which um, creates a new protocol to merge, to integrate uh, the perception maps from different focal groups into one joint visualization of the current and future marine spatial planning network in Brazil. So, this is the visualization of public government's perceptions, uh, authorities' perceptions. It's an integrated view uh, on the current and future MSP network in Brazil. The thicker edges, the connections, were perceived by a large number of participants. Larger nodes, as you see, represent us more powerful organizations. On both networks, the, the, the current network and the future network, what they envision that it, the MSP should go towards to. Um, on both networks, more, note that uh, public actors in pink predominate and in number and power. Also note the dominance of interactions between public actors and their close relationships with powerful forums. Powerful, these forums are in blue, the stakeholder, multiple stakeholder forums, government, authorities, and then you have civil society on the margins of the, the network. So this is a nice way to see where, where, where they perceive power is and who are the important actors in their view. So, um, the transformative capacity of ocean networks is increasingly necessary, but also untapped in its full potential. Network building drive marine research and policy initiatives worldwide anyway, yet ocean networks are often afterthoughts or remain volunteer efforts due to a lack of committed resources. The transformative capacity of ocean networks have never been so necessary, yet with so much potential still untapped. Um, I'll close with uh, saying that the UN Ocean Decade is a global movement to change how we co-create and share knowledge and uh, that we need to find new ways of creating self-organizing, bottom-up learning, and impact networks. Ocean actors need to be able to find each other. Experiences and uh, potential solutions need to be shared openly in the near real time, unimpeded by language or technology barriers. We need to break free from top-down hierarchical systems to enable co-creation of ocean knowledge by self-organizing networks and communities. Um, I'm now currently working on a toolbox of participatory network mapping so we can make accessible this type of marine social science methodology. Uh, and one that could be adapted, for instance, to various, various types of action research purposes, including for steering networks of ocean biophysical observations, uh, or even to enable observations of human interactions uh, in governance systems, amongst other, other applications. It's a kind of a, a, a method that can be tailored to, to the needs of different projects. So with that, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Leopoldo. Uh, fascinating uh, difference in perspective of the, uh, of the network. Uh, we're now going to turn to Erin Satterthwaite. Uh, she is a marine ecologist at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who works on ocean sustainability related to marine biodiversity, fisheries and mariculture, biological and ecosystem oceanography, social economic ecological systems uh, and stakeholder engagement. She is particularly interested in use-inspired research to understand um, biological and social impacts of climate change. She is uh, uh, coordinating one of the longest marine ecosystem time series, the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations, CalCoffee. Uh, and in this role, she's conducting applied research relevant to sustainable marine resources in the context of changing climate. Erin. Great, thanks so much, Margaret. And thank you all for being here. This is such a treat. So I'm really looking forward to sharing with you this idea of thinking about marine ecosystem observations to support sustainability and resilience. I think 
in line very much with the theme of the session today. And so I wanted to start off very broad. This is the vision that guides me, and I think, at least for me, has really resonated in thinking about how do we move toward this envisioned future of a resilient and vibrant global marine ecosystems and human communities. And to me, this is really the integrated ecosystem solutions are a key piece of this. So I put this up here because I think we really want to be there, right in that middle, that sweet middle spot where sustainability happens, um, but that really requires integrating across these different aspects of society. And so scaling up ocean solutions, very much in line with the theme of this conference, requires that we have a way to learn and adapt over time. And I think this is especially important because the systems that we're working in, we know, are highly complex. That's been said a lot, but I think it's really important to emphasize that because this learning and adaptation is needed in these complex systems. We don't know right away what we need to do. We need to keep evolving. And so to me, this is where long-term ocean observations come in. And I especially like to think of them as our sensory system for society. Think of it in the same way that we have our eyes, ears, nose, mouth. We have all of these different observing systems, physics, chemistry, biology, and society that can contribute to our holistic understanding of the system. And so a global observing system for marine life is especially important because marine life we know is foundational to many aspects of human, cultural, ecological, and societal well-being, and really can contribute to this envisioned larger scale holistic understanding of our ocean relevant to societal needs. And so to understand this, the extent of this observing system, um, we had worked with the Goose Bioeco Panel and many other partners to conduct this global assessment of what is being done globally. And we found that 7% of the global surface ocean, I want to emphasize surface ocean here, um, is covered by marine biological observations. And so I'd, I'd also like to note, if you don't see a program that you know of or are part of, you or if you see your program and you want to check it out, um, you can go to this interactive portal that's still under development. Um, we'd really like this to be an iterative interactive process. And as you can see, that the observations tend to be concentrated around coasts and developed nations, as well as kind of more in the mid-latitude areas. And so from this work, there were a couple kind of key points that came out of it, which were maybe seem obvious, but I think are extremely important to highlight here, that biological observations need to be sustained, they need to be coordinated, they need to be integrated, and then expanded. And I think I'm really looking forward to the, the next panel for that reason, thinking about how do we continue to expand and grow these observations. So the first piece of that is to sustain existing long-term biological observing programs through novel technologies, so things like environmental DNA or other sorts of processing, you know, AI and acoustics, as well as diverse stakeholder and early career engagement. And I wanted to highlight that piece because that's something um, recently at Scripps Oceanography, there's been a novel partnership between California Sea Grant and Cal Coffee, that's the role that I've been working in, in thinking about how do we really do this diverse engagement to make sure that the observations we're taking are relevant to these societal needs, that this requirement setting really involves people at the forefront. So the next piece is the coordination piece, and I think thinking about the networks that we've been talking about here, how do we coordinate existing networks around these stakeholder needs, and this is especially important through existing coordinating networks, like we heard Goose and others, as well as many of these new or merging UN Ocean Decade programs, things like we've heard of Marine Life 2030, OBON, as well as uh, SmartNet and GEOS. So many programs that are starting to emerge that can start to help with this coordination. 
And then the third piece is this integration. So this one is, for me, very near and dear to my heart. How do we integrate, then, these ecological and societal observations to truly understand our entire ecosystem more holistically? So thinking about societal observations here, I'm referring to things like cultural, social, economic metrics, bringing those together with ecosystem, um, sorry, ecological observations to have that ecological understanding. And um, this is actually something we've been doing um, in partnership with the Interagency Ocean Observations Committee, as well as with California Sea Grant, kind of from state and federal levels, thinking, looking at existing programs and seeing how well these different social and ecological metrics are being included in existing programs. And then the, the fourth piece is this expansion. So this is so not only working with what we have, we have a lot of amazing work happening out there, but there are some areas, as you saw, about 93% of the global surface ocean didn't have any observations that we could find. <laughs> and so this is especially important along the coast of developing nations, as well as in deep ocean basins and near the poles. So really thinking about how do we do this well and how do we continue to grow are observing networks in this integrated way. So in closing, I think a key part of this is in achieving this social ecological observing system for sustainability that kind of brings us to this vibrant future. I think the long-term relationships are a key part of this, and so I'm really happy to see all of you in the room, and it's been a treat to get to connect over the course of this conference. And I just wanted to close with, I, I love this quote, observation, not old age, brings wisdom. And so thinking about this, this vital wisdom we need to move to, toward a sustainable future together. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, I look forward to questions. Thanks, Erin. All of our speakers said they look forward to questions. So? Yes. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding the deep ocean stewardship, uh, both to uh, Lisa and Erin especially. Um, first of all, thanks also, Lisa, for this uh, very holistic view of um, ecosystem functioning and services of the deep sea. And as we have seen uh, in many of the presentations, especially as Erin has summarized, like 7% of the ocean are uh, cur currently observed. Um, we know that this is not the case for the deep sea, and there are very um, uh, um, yeah, confrontative uh, discussions uh, in some of the, the rooms uh, regarding deep sea mining. Nevertheless, we know that um, we depend on the life and the species and the deep sea. So my question regards especially the observations of the species. I mean, they are under threat not only by uh, deep sea mining, by many um, other issues uh, and, and um, changes like uh, global change, our litter and everything. So are there already sort of observing systems um, for species like monitoring stations in place or planned? Because I think this will be a very important contribution to Goose as well. Thank you. I guess, is this on? Yeah. I guess I'll go first and then you can add, add to it. Um, well, Angelica, thank you for the question. I mean, you know some of the obs observatories that exist already that have long-term records of species and some of the time series. You point out a really big problem in the deep sea. We haven't found or described most of the species that are there. Um, I do know that people are moving in the direction of new technologies that can observe species and maybe someday Argo floats will have eDNA 
chips to record species, and maybe Margaret would like to say something about what Ob Oban has planned, but um, I, I think that there needs to be more discussion of innovative, outside-the-box things we can do to get species records. Making sound one of the um, essential ocean variables has the potential to help us understand when marine mam different marine mammal species go by and we're learning fish how it makes sound, so maybe we'll be able to detect fish species, but I think we need to do more in that direction. Uh, back here. Uh, hello, good morning. Cristina Brito from the Center of Humanities of Nova University and um, ERC Grant for Oceans, where we are studying the human history of oceans exploitation. I, I have a question, well, two questions, if I may, on the first one on, on data management. How, what's your take on the fact that we might need to um, get different typology of data together from the natural sciences and the social and the human sciences? How do we get all these types of different information in one eventually global system uh, of information? Uh, maybe Toste or Leopoldo, I'm not sure. And, and to Corinne, um, in your masters, how do you deal with different people having different uh, languages. Do you, do you use English as lingua franca or do you allow for Portuguese, Spanish, I don't know, French to be present? Thank you so much for the panel. So thank, thank you uh, for, for the question. Maybe I can take a stab at the data management part. And we have some distinguished data management in the audience. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> but we, the, the key here is the FAIR principles, findable, interoperable, reusable, and accessible. Uh, probably wrong order here. <clears throat> because all of our data are going to go to different data repositories for different reasons. Some is the funding agencies, some because that is the repository of choice for that type of data you've been doing. But if you are making sure that you have appropriate metadata and an interoperable system, you can harvest all this data and you can understand what they mean, how they were done, who made them, and, and what they mean. And the only way is to move to FAIR. And in addition to that, we need to work on the latency. Uh, we need to be faster in, in making our data available. We need to be open and, and, and free because FAIR doesn't talk about open and free. So these are four ingredients I think that's important. Um, when it comes to merging natural science data with social data, we are not even hardly started there. I think we have a long, long way to go. In, in Goose, we have been starting to work on the dimension of economy and ocean observing. We haven't even started to think about cultural and, and uh, social interactions. I think that's something that we need to move on. So I don't think we have a system in place yet to, to exchange data on that, but maybe that's coming. You want to finish the question about language, mm -hmm. and then we'll, one, then we'll take you. Okay, uh, it's okay. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, the Waskal uh, official language is English. Um, and the, the students, uh, before they start the, the program, they have uh, four months uh, first in the selection, so they must uh, prove they have at least an uh, intermediate background in, in English, but uh, after they have four months of uh, training in English, that is happening in Accra. Thank you. Can I jump in? Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, uh, you, you're right. Uh, human interactions and uh, human dimensions of, of the ocean, it's uh, very a complex thing to go forward. I'll speak from my perspective of working with fisher folk, for instance. Uh, so we have both the, the difference that with biological beings you don't need to go through when you're doing a research to go through um, very important uh, um, ethical aspects of what you do. Of course you do, but with human beings you, you need like, uh, they need to be aware of what, where the, that information is going through to feed what type of decisions because they, usually they provide the, the, the information 
information, but it is not part of uh, what goes on. So that uh, information about the fishery, for instance, can feed up some conservation planning that will, in the end, uh, block the access to some particular fishing sites. So there are different layers of, uh, you need to interact on a more regular basis with, you, with the beans. And also from the, the policy perspective, you have environmental licensing, for instance, and different agencies in, in government collecting information with, uh, with, with fishers, for instance, on, on the catch. But um, the, the, there's a lot of um, uh, ocean, ocean um, what do you call it, the uh, consultancy companies that provide services for big entrepreneurs. They don't have the same responsibility nor um, legislation on their backs to collect information for, from the ground. Also, it's a big problem. And then this information flows to different departments and becomes fragmented. So there's a whole lot of uh, layers of difficulties that we have to think of when uh, we think about integrating the human dimension on the observations community. Thank you. So, all good things last three, three, I try it again. My name is Barbara Neumann from the Institute of, for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And first, I wanted to say thank you for this uh, panel and putting together these various perspectives on ocean observation. That's really great and inspiring. Um, and the question I have is uh, to Erin Satterthwaite, but perhaps to everyone, relating to what you said, Erin, that uh, ocean observing is a sensor for society. And I was thinking about the problems that we have are really moving quickly and we need to take also foresight decisions uh, if we you know, want to take good decisions. That is one of my thoughts. Uh, I work on ocean governance and also social ecological systems, thinking much behind that. So the question I would have to you and to the panel is, do you think about integrating a foresight component or integrating scenario building into the observation systems? Thanks. Great. Thanks for your question. I think that's a fa fabulous thought and I think the foresight piece is, is essential as you mentioned. Um, I think the way that we've been thinking about it, at least in the kind of from the ecosystem or biological perspective is um, ecological forecasting. And I think that's a, a definitely important kind of emerging aspect that could really speak to this. But I, I think you're right that there's, there's a real opportunity to kind of continue to include that and have that be a key part of it. And I just kind of in line with that, I guess what Toste mentioned about the, the um, kind of latency or making sure that we have observations available early. I think that in some ways also speaks, it's kind of not only looking, kind of forecasting or looking ahead, but also how do we have that information um, more real time, whatever that means, <laughs> um, but more real time to more quickly adapt and make changes and be a little more nimble. I think having these systems that are so large and slow can be really hard then to kind of have that more forward looking or forward moving aspect. So yeah, thank you. I think that's a fabulous question and I'll let others, if you'd like to chime in. For me? Yes, uh, the, so we're talking about uh, futures methods and there's um, uh, several initiatives that is worth looking uh, with towards too. So for instance, the IPBS is working with nature futures methodology where uh, there's uh, seeds of Anthropocene where you get the, the, uh, the what, what kind of innovations we have around us and then how these innovations, if they flourish and become the, co the common uh, things. That so there's this sustainable, the social, sustain social pathways, um, socioeconomic pathways that IPCC is working with. It's another methodology to envision different uh, archetypes of future so you can, uh, uh, but the problem is that m most of these methodologies still rely a lot on social scientists, uh, transdisciplinary scientists working with communities. So uh, I think that we, uh, like for instance, gaming and uh, pr promoting uh, promoting different ac accessible methodologies so that people can themselves contribute with knowledge, either through, through 
material, games, prototypes, but also board games, but also digital interfaces where you can feed this continuously on different levels. For instance, I've showed the net participatory network mapping approach, is one approach in marine social science, and we actually are trying to develop, uh, we did, uh, also we can envision the current network, but we can also envision what the network should move towards to and create shared perspectives on uh, what, the, what the connections need to occur, uh, how power mu must be changed, and these sort of issues can be explored. And I think it's time for the marine social science community to join forces with, uh, with all of you. Eurasy, for instance, we do have a task on foresight, and we're looking at foresight. So that's certainly on our agenda. I think we can look at foresight in different rooms. We can kind of anticipate new technologies and new possibilities, how we can observe and deliver the observations to the, to the users. We can also look at new requirements. And one example here is the need to observe and assess the efficiency of adaptation measures in, in the climate change and responding to the Paris Agreement, that would be one. And we are working on trying to understand how we can build an observing system that is not only kind of tracking the natural system but can inform adaptation and mitigation measures and I think linking that to the digital twin concept is, is really important here. And we're also looking at uh, foresight in terms of governance and how we organize ourselves, how we can give more integrated and, and deliver the observations or rather the information to society in a more efficient way than we have today. So foresight is something that we think about and I would be happy to, to have some more discussions with you and put some on, on that as we move along. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving us a view of how global ocean observing is evolving to be able to be global ocean observing for sustainability. Thanks so much. Okay. Right. Great. Um, thank you very much for uh, turning up for one of the uh, last uh, side events at this great UN Oceans Conference. And uh, we have a, a really nice uh, session now, perhaps looking at moving from some of the very interesting perspectives we've had uh, towards action. And so I'd like to invite my distinguished panel onto the stage. Um, we're going to hear from, and our other distinguished panel member who's going to remain on stage. Um, the aim of this part of the, uh, the session is to have a discussion. Uh, have a discussion about sustained ocean observing for sustainable development and something very close to, to my heart. Um, I'm Emma Heslop, Acting Director of the Global Ocean Observing System, GOOS. And so I'm, I'm really interested in supporting the expansion of the Global Ocean Observing System to support society's problems and also to support opportunities, support uh, nations to, to really be able to uh, develop sustainably and to support their, their blue economies as, as well as face perhaps mitigation and adaptation me uh, measures for, for climate change. And 
one key element of this, as we've heard many times across the UN Oceans Conference, is to address how we could support, how we could do better at uh, supporting uh, large ocean states, uh, or, or SIDS, I, I quite like large ocean states, uh, from the large ocean institutes of the world uh, towards uh, achieving these aims. And as we've listened to the, the presentations today and across the, the whole of the, the UN conference, perhaps generate some, some ideas about how we mo might go about that. And so to achieve this uh, and to work on this together, uh, we have some we have uh, some very distinguished uh, guests, both from large ocean states and also from uh, large uh, ocean institutes to, to get together and maybe take a, a few moments to, to brainstorm uh, in, in these areas and, and talk together about how we could collaborate uh, uh, on, on issues or, or ideas in this development. So perhaps moving from perspectives to, to some discussion about what those actions are and how we could go about doing something. So, uh, to that end, uh, I would like to uh, first of all invite um, Ambassador Ronald Jumeau, who is the permanent representative to the UN um, and Ambassador for Climate Change for the Republic of the Seychelles, to, to give some perspectives. And Ambassador Jumeau has a really um, long history uh, in uh, issues of climate change related to SIDS, and so he will have some really interesting perspectives to, to share from us uh, before we, we then turn to uh, what the large ocean institutes might, might think about this. So, uh, let me welcome you to the podium. Thank you. And morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you especially to Lisa and Erin for setting the scene for what I'm going to say. Just to give you a background, I, I come from Seychelles, which as an island state is one of amongst the 13 smallest countries in the world, until you look at our EEZ. Our EEZ at 1.34 million square kilometers is 3,000 times bigger than all our islands put together. We are 99.9% .9 ocean, which makes us a big ocean state or a boss, as we like to say, rather than a, a, a large ocean state, which makes us a loss. So don't write us off that quickly. <laughs> now, just to, to, to set the scene here, Seychelles has protected 30% of its territory, the various types of protection. That's 410,000 square kilometers or 155,000 square miles. It's bigger, that 30% is bigger than Japan or Germany. Imagine Japan or Germany being run by less than 100,000 people. That's our, our population. Half of the 30%, 15% of our EZ is fully and highly protected as part of the 30 by 30 campaign. The 15% the of Seychelles waters is protected is bigger than Greece, bigger than Bangladesh, bigger than Senegal. That makes us natural allies of all the scientists in the room, and we've been, we, we are now finalizing the second largest marine spatial plan in the world after that of Norway, but without the resources of Norway. So we are natural allies, we, you know, we, we believe in the science. As small island developing states within the climate change process, we have always been, that's why we can't be challenged on scientifically because we've always followed the science. And so here we are going around and planning the future of Seychelles. And then COVID-19, followed by the war in Ukraine, came along and started to change things in SIDS, in island states. And I'll explain why. Many of us, are heavily dependent on tourism. Secondly, we're dependent on fisheries. When COVID-19 came along and shut down international tra travel, our economy nearly collapsed. Our debt to GDP ratio shot up from 58%, we were headed to a target of 50% by 2025, to 93%. 
And then along came the war. As we were coming out of COVID, along came the war in Ukraine. And it just so happens that at that time, our biggest source of tourists was in Eastern Europe and Russia. And things went on a tailspin. So in a lot of island states, and this is playing out a lot in the Pacific, there's a lot of talk about diversification of the economy. When you have a country of mine, 115 islands, merely 455 square kilometers, and half of, half of, of, of Seychelles Islands, our land territory, 47% actually, is protected. It's, it's the second highest ratio of protected land in the world after Nepal, I think. Where are you going to diversify on an, on an island that's small? There's only one place we can diversify. It's the ocean, which is 3,000 times bigger. And what is playing out now is that there are people who are coming to advise us on how we can diversify. And it's not necessarily in favor of the marine species, habitats, and ecosystems. You all know what's happening with deep sea fishing. You all know what's happening at the International Seabed Authority, the ISAO ESA, where there's a big push for deep sea fishing. And it has divided the Pacific Islands. Unfortunately, another speaker, Ambassador Prasad of Fiji, could not make it. Fiji is one of the countries that's pushing for the moratorium. There are other Pacific islands that are pushing for seabed mining. They're whispering in the, in the ears of the new government in Seychelles. And as Lisa pointed out, of the, of the 1.3 million square kilometers, 70% of our territory is deep ocean. And one of the reasons we put up the marine spatial plan was because to, get, to, to generate the science and the research to find out what do we have in our waters, where is it, what is its economic, social, and cultural value for us to be able to make, to take an informed, scientific-based decision as to our future under SDG 14. And suddenly now, the deep sea mining community is feeling emboldened because we are weakened economically. And now we've recovered. We've recovered. Seychelles grew by 8% in 2021. And we're predicted to grow by 7.1%. We've recovered. But even our recovery is scaring us far more than when we went into a tailspin because it's underlining how heavily dependent we are on tourism. It's a very risky situation to be in. And the way the world is going is not offering us any, any comfort as to, oh, things will be better later on. I'm, I don't believe in that anymore. So governments which are elected to look after the welfare of their people are under pressure. We have to find other sources of income. So the scientists in the room, the institutions in the room, have to take that into consideration. It's a, it's a, conserva uh, a conservation that's taken on added urgency. And it's coming quick, because Nauru, one of the smallest, of the, of, is the smallest independent sovereign state um, in the world, is the one that triggered the two-year rule at the, uh, at the International Seabed Authority, giving ISA only two years to come up with the regulations and all the precautionary, uh, precautionary um, actions that need to be done. And after two years, we go ahead with deep sea mining, unless the move for a moratorium gathers pace and takes hold internationally. And we can't leave it just to the ISA, it has to be done outside. And President Macron here said something very interesting about, about stepping in there. Because what you're going to do, the people you, you took for granted as being your natural allies in terms of governments and, ecosystems and economies are now being hit left, right, and center. Governments have to survive. Elections are coming up. They have to find a source of, of, of food, of, of job security, of livelihoods. So this is the message, the, the warning bell that I, I want to sound. Take that into consideration as you plan going forward that these deep sea areas that you took for granted you can come and do your science in, 
you, not, you may have to, to, to share with undersea, uh, undersea bulldozers which are churning up the water, affecting not just the seabed, seabed the water columns above. You all know, know the story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that very interesting and also pertinent to the situation we are in today thoughts. I, it really is important that uh, when we look at ocean observing and especially with SIDS and the, the issues that you face with um, large EEZs to GDP ratios that it, sustainable development is about having a sustainable blue economy and how do we best support that. So I thank you very much for that. So we now have a slight change to, uh, to, to the advertised agenda and uh, we had a sort of a, a late cancellation unfortunately but very fortunately we get to have uh, Corinne Almeida stay on, on stage. Ah, oh, sorry. You have to leave, right, okay. <laughs> Would you, right, so we have another very quick change of schedule, so we will hear uh, a reflection from one of our, our, our large um, ocean institutes, uh, because I know that Francois Hollande has to leave for uh, a plane, um, and we would like to hear from him before he, he departs, uh, so please go ahead. I'm not really sorry to trouble the, the organization. Uh, because I indeed to leave. Uh, I, I did very much appreciate the first panel. Uh, maybe I will react to two or three things. Um, the first, as an echo to you said uh, for Moscow, uh, at this stage, these very days, there is a floating university that we did organize in France in the Indian Ocean, which is interdisciplinary, which is something quite common with biologists, ecologists, uh, people interested in physics of the ocean and chemistry, but it is also interprofessional in the sense that there are artists on board, students in arts, also students in different um, uh, types of careers, um, meaning for example mechanicians or future marine officers, so it's interdisciplinary, interprofessional, and it is, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency, it is also international. And there are students from Seychelles Island, from Tanzania, from uh, um, Kenya, uh, from, of course, of France, who are on board. And we also paid a lot of attention to uh, uh, the, the gender balance there. So I mentioned that because I was very much seduced by what you uh, uh, proposed uh, about Wascal. But I think this is a kind of initiative that we can develop if we consider, for example, the Indian Ocean as a common good, and if we consider science as a common good, I think this is the type of initiative that we should replicate um, in the different research institutes, and I think uh, the example of Oscar is a very good example. Uh, maybe the second point I wanted to make is um, uh, something that you, uh, um, you just spoke about, um, deep sea mining, and, and there was um, in the first panel uh, a few things that were said about the, the lack of information that we do have on the deep sea environments. So uh, our organization is already involved in the EMSO, which is a network of uh, uh, deep sea and water column observatories, and we very much are interested in continuing that. Uh, we have a colleague who was here these days and who was coming back from Azor Island, uh, where we have a, such an observatory. Uh, we just recently committed to develop two new ones, um, one um, which is uh, in New Caledonia uh, and uh, in the Pacific uh, Ocean and that will be developed in collaboration with Japan, in fact, uh, and we feel that it's important to have uh, international collaboration. And the other one will be in front of uh, Mayotte Island, again in the Indian Ocean because of this uh, submarine volcano that was discovered uh, a few years ago. Um, so if we feel that it's important that we add some uh, uh, some new observations in different situations. Uh, and the last point I would like to mention is, of course, uh, deep sea and water column observatories are quite expensive. And then the last point I wanted to mention is that the other day we had a very nice dinner with uh, Edel. And, uh, uh, and I, we feel that long-term observation, which is badly needed, as was said before, uh, especially in the high seas, is expensive and is not that well funded by our governments. And so there is a big challenge. Uh, I understand that this is, 
even more true when it comes to smaller islands. But for the high seas, there is definitely a big challenge. When we want to maintain, for example, networks such as Argo, uh, for the, on the French side, we are obliged to bring together different pieces of uh, funding, and that's not that easy. So I, we are able to commit for the next 10 years, but so there is a definitely a, a challenge in funding on the long run, the observation, uh, deep sea, but also uh, surface observation. So these were my, my, my reactions and, uh, and my appreciation of the first panel and, uh, and my small contribution to this panel. I'm sorry that I will have to leave, but that's the way the planes are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francois, and uh, thank you for interrupting and raising your hand. Um, and I hope you make the plane. So, right. So um, we will turn back to, uh, to to hear some perspectives. We, uh, with with uh, Corinne, um, we we had a, a little discussion in the over coffee before um, before the the session started, and I I think that Corinne has with her experience, as you saw, um, with the Wascal um, floating university and the, 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 the undergraduate scheme, to, to, to pose some perspectives on what that might mean for uh, sustainable ocean observing um, for, for uh, well, big ocean states. So, uh, good morning again. Um, thank you. Um, this, um, for one, so uh, in the first moment, we were enthusiastic to, to facilitate opportunities for these West African students and to, and to, to have this opportunity to train and to deliver to, to them a good training. But now they are start to finishing their uh, graduate courses. We have a concern, and it's another problem that, that rise, that uh, because there isn't too many institutions uh, in marine science in West Africa, and, and when they exist, they, they do not have um, too, much, uh, too many places for employment. So, some of the students, so some continue studying, but some of them still waiting for another opportunity. So uh, it is great that we are working in training them, but this will be, uh, so this uh, training just will be proficuous and useful if they have uh, possibilities to, and opportunities to keep working, especially uh, in ocean observation uh, in their region. Because what will happen in some times, so for example, uh, one of them now is now in, uh, studying in the United States, another in uh, Germany, is maybe they will not come back. So it's important that we can create opportunities. So besides training, but we should also move forward in creating opportunities in order they can be integrated and be retained in, uh, in, this, uh, in their home countries or in our region. Um, uh, in this point, so uh, one possibility that I think that uh, we was discussing Maybe could be because we, we there is, for example, these examples of uh, networks of observation that should be extended to the uh, to this region, not just for the for the needs of this region, but for the needs of the whole world, because uh, is all of us know how important is the tropical region. Uh, for the climate system, so uh, is a need for uh, is a need. Uh, there is a need of study to understand better for our uh, our main uh, main needs, especially regarding to fisheries, regarding to coastal erosion. But it's also a, a global need. So for that, uh, uh, is important to. Uh, try to integrate. The, the one point could be, for example, start with uh, internships, paid internships uh, associated to these, um, like, goals, uh, 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 these, um, 
uh, observation systems. So being paid in the institution in their countries, they continue and maybe with time, with examples, because of course, because we are not having doing ocean observation, maybe especially uh, he, he told he is jealous for our scholarship, but I am most jealous because of their commitment with science. So we still have in our countries uh, uh, take uh, science more seriously and uh, to, to, to base our decision. So it will be important. So give these examples for our politicians of having science uh, and with time these students or this that was our former students so these professionals will be integrated in the in their institution their home country because they had proven the utility of the data they get so. thank you very much Corinne. So I, I think this is a really great perspective to take into account in the, in the work we, we, we need to do under the, the ocean decade. And certainly the, the discussion in that GOOS has a, a program aimed at capacity development called Observing Together uh, to help uh, nations develop their ocean observing capacity, but make sure that it's, uh, it's focused on the needs of, of uh, those communities that, uh, that want to uh, put the, the projects into observing together. But I, I don't think we necessarily thought about this aspect of maintaining and ensuring that, uh, that employment is available for, for graduates. And I think that it's, uh, you know, it's an important principle that perhaps we could take back. Um, right, I'm going to turn to the large uh, ocean institutes and we have uh, some, some uh, fantastic leadership who've been thinking about this, this question and perhaps thinking also about you know, what we might do within the ocean decade and how institutes might, might look at collaborating together because in, together I think we, we can go further um, uh, whereas individually we, we might go faster. Uh, and, and we, you know, we need to uh, go further within the decade. So, first of all, I'm going to turn to Margaret Leinen, who is the director of Scripps Institute of Oceanography uh, in San Diego in the United States. So, over to you, Margaret. Thanks, Emma. Uh, thanks so much, Karen, for that. Um, that w uh, I had three points that I wanted to talk about, and that was the first, both the issue that both you and the ambassador have raised about the importance of observing being related to the economy and jobs and or the economy, uh, you know, what's the source of wealth for the country. And I think that, that we need to be thinking about that reality uh, as we think about sustaining ocean observation. The second uh, is a, a reflection I've had from a few things that I've heard at sessions over this week. And uh, the first time I heard it was at a dinner that had a lot of uh, environment ministers and director generals of agencies associated with this. And uh, I, I won't say which country or individual it was, but one of them got up and said, it's time to stop with the science and start with the action. And it received an incredible round of applause. And I think that that's, we as scientists, tend to think, yes, you go start with the action, we'll just keep observing uh, because, you know, eventually it's going to be good for you. And I think that this is wrapped around that same issue that we saw reflected by the ambassador um, and, uh, and Corinne, that unless we have just absolutely, utterly linked the products of ocean observing not to just understanding the ocean better, but that, that economic piece, we're going to face more and more calls for diverting resources that we think are insufficient already uh, for ocean observing to action. 
And I saw that repeated several times in, in various sessions over the week. And I think that that's a really important message for us all, especially for those of us who are directors of institutions and have the ability to talk about what the message is. The third thing that I want to mention is that I have been uh, incredibly impressed by the, the way that uh, that politics around the ocean has seized on this issue of big ambition, big commitments for 30 by 30, um, protecting marine areas. And, you know, thousands of commitments, if you start from back at the first Our Ocean Summit and go through the One Ocean Process and the UN Ocean Conferences. And uh, people are rightfully proud of that and celebrate that. I think that we need to focus on a similar kind of big ambition for the observations that are going to generate the knowledge for sustainable development and start talking about the, the real, uh, that side of the products in addition to the side of, you know, more understanding of the ocean. Part of that is uh, that sense of we know enough science already and, you know, we can stop with the science and start with the action. And I think that it's going to be important for us to remind people how recently some of these big discoveries came out of observation. You know, it was only about 15 years ago that the Royal Society report on ocean acidification came out. It's only been about 10 years since we first started uh, really hearing about uh, deoxygenation. Uh, we're just this year hearing uh, some very, very different perspectives on meridional overturning circulation and the potential for that to really be uh, a, fa a, a factor that we thought was much further down the line uh, in climate. So I think that we have to demonstrate the, the way that this helps us discover and I think that we ha need to demonstrate the way that it helps economies and we have to show a lot more ambition about the, the getting ocean leadership, not, not, at our le not at our level, but at the political level, rallied around this issue of the importance of the observation because we can't deliver the sustainability and the economic growth without it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Margaret. And uh, I must confess that I, I really hear your call to action for, for practical measures. This is uh, very important to me. I had a a career private prior to ocean observing in business, and this is a, a practical environment um, and around, uh, uh, around the economy and you know, sustaining businesses, but equally well, uh, we, need, we need for, for ocean observing to flourish in, in areas, it needs to be connected into uh, the businesses of, of the, um, of the uh, large ocean states, and this should really be a be part of that focus. So thank you very much for that. So now I would like to call upon Katia Mathis, uh, Director uh, of Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research based in Kiel, Germany, and one of the co-organizers. Um, thank you very much, Emma. And um, I'm very happy to, see, to be here, to see this room full of people. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk about ocean sustained ocean observing system. And I would like to to um, give also my perspective, add to what Francois and Margaret said. Um, when I started as a GEOMA director in the middle of the pandemic, um, one and a half years ago, um, I um, gave a new slogan to GEOMA. Our world is the ocean, and the meaning is twofold. One is that there is a strong relationship between humans and the ocean, 
and um, there is a lot of interaction between humans and the ocean. And on the other hand, there is a lot of experience at Geomar, and we observe, we've heard from many people in the panel before, we observe and we try to understand the ocean system. And this is common to all um, big five ocean institutions, of course, that we try to understand on the one hand side the ocean, and on the other hand, we are enabling the development of sustainable solutions. And this is what Margaret said. For sustainable, we need both. We need, we need basic science, we need the discovery part, and we need the solution part. The ocean is a solution to climate change, and we can only manage and use um, our knowledge if we measure it. And we need to keep monitoring. The AMOC is one example. We still don't know or whether the AMOC is weakening due to climate change, because we do not have long enough observations. And we heard um, a lot of examples on sustained ocean observations, how important they are, GOOS, EUROSEA. We heard the, um, the example of uh, Cabo Verde, of Mindelo, the Ocean Science Center, the Vascal University, capacity development, so international international interaction networking is really, really important. And we talked about sustained ocean observing system, and here one point is really important. Only 30% of the ocean observing system is sustained. Everything is based on project money. And I'm an atmospheric scientist, so I would like to compare it to the meteorological observation system, which is um, handled by the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. And there we have 70% of the observations that are sustain, sustainably funded. So we need something similar um, on a global level for the ocean observing system. So. And thank you. So we need to recognize the ocean observing system as a critical infrastructure. This is really, really important. And um, Margaret um, talked from, from knowledge to action. In order to come into action, we need the knowledge and we need the measurements. And um, ocean observing is also critical for digital twins, for the enhanced prediction of the system, etc. So it's really the basics and um, it's really needed um, for ocean science for solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katia. So I would like to call upon our, our final panelists now. Um, who is Angela Hatton, uh, who is Director of Data Science and Technology at, uh, the, at uh, the National Oceanographic Centre in the UK. So, Angela, please. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to kind of completely agree with a lot of what's been said, you know, it's, but it's, it's not about science and, or action. It's about the whole thing. And there's no point to me doing any of the ocean observations and the science unless it makes a difference. And so, it's essential we do large space and scale research with observations that can allow us to know the big changes going on. But without working in the coastal environment where we're making real decisions about what that means and how you might manage it and how you might adjust, you know, particularly we're talking about the economics. You know, if there's a change, you need to be able to understand you know, how cultural change needs to come about, what the cost is, what the cost benefit is. How do, we don't bring about change just by saying we can see it's a problem. We only bring about change by working with others. And I think it's really important we, we do that both sides. Um, I think we need to turn it on its head. We've tended to, or certainly I have in the past, tended to think of it as observations that will go to models that will be useful to end users. And I really think we need to start from what do people need, to where, how do we need to present that, to therefore what are the models or the data that they need, to therefore what are the observations. And that won't take away from the observations we do, because the questions we answer, ask, address will still be the same. But the way in which we address them and how we feed that in will be completely different. Um, I was asked to think about, coming here to think about what we've learned from working with a number of large ocean states. And we, we have uh, projects across the world with people. 
And I've learned an awful lot of things personally, but I've also, I think as an organization, we've learned a lot of things. And we've worked on a, a lot of projects, but I've put four things down here just to, to mention. The first thing is, it's about partnership. So when we're working with others, it's not about us doing stuff for, and, and them using it. It's about partnership. And that's just not just the, the big ocean labs. That's working with policy and capacity building. Could we change that to capacity exchange? I've learned so much more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've, I've learned so much more from actually listening to people than I have, I think, maybe communicated to them. And I think we, we tend to approach this really poorly. So that's my first one. I think we have to do that. Um, secondly, it's all of this always should be about purpose. What are we trying to achieve? Because the rest of it should follow from that purpose. So for me, it's purpose comes first, then design that addresses that purpose, and then ensuring that purpose means the models, the data, the observations are fit for purpose for the specifics of the question we're trying to address. Um, which leads to kind of another which, which is we need to actually understand what the local needs are. There's, you know, uh, Often we will get caught up in the bigger picture and forget those real local defined issues that we need to address. And we have, if we work together, we can do that. We can bring that knowledge together. Um, and then finally, which I don't know if everyone will like this comment, but for me, it's about letting go of ownership. And the thing for me is it's about what are we trying to achieve? And when I say that, that's ownership of capital or infrastructure or data or who gets credit what we should be thinking about is what we're trying to achieve not who we've got to get credit for achieving it and so i think we just need to to start thinking about that and i i raised at a biogeochemistry argo meeting recently and we were talking about how if we kind of talk to each other we might be able to get a better deal because we're all buying floats from the same people and i was like why don't we just put all the money in one pot and have one place buy all the floats and a really good deal and and work on how we distribute them well and there was almost like when i mentioned this to a few people it's been like oh we can't do that because our country would want to to have the floats and, and be, own the floats. And I was thinking, we literally throw them off the back of a ship <laughs> and the data goes to everyone. Why does somebody want to own that? Why don't we just say, this is our commitment. I'm putting it into this pot. You make the best deal for it. You put it in the right place. And that when we talk about working together, that's what we need to do. So I think that I um, absolutely agree whether it's a global base and scale or whether it's coastal, for me, it's got to be about doing that. Um, and then lastly, talking too much, uh, I think we're all doing loads of things so we're doing things in countries across the world and we're working with people um, and some of the things we've really learned again is is this co-design now when we we did work we've gone out of that recent project we've just finished um, the PIs which who were from Nokan from South Africa they went to all the countries and they took six visits before we ever started the project or finished designing the project. Before any work was done, they'd gone and visited and they co-designed everything. We developed a, a MOOC, so it's a massive open access online course, and we co-designed that with all our partners. We didn't put something out there to teach people, we co-designed it. So again, we've got to start thinking that way, but we've really got to start thinking that way in a, in a global perspective. And, and I kind of wanted to finish on the, the, the kind of expeditions and bringing people on board. Um, what we've been doing is we realize this, we're taking ships on occasion and we have berths that aren't occupied. So we've started putting that out to anybody in the world to come and, you know, we've, we've got um, support from uh, commercial companies to help sponsor people to come and join the expeditions. And there's two things in that. Firstly, it actually is really good because it's a good training thing. We take early career resources from anywhere. But the second thing is we develop the partnerships for the future. You build those trusted relationships and it becomes just something we work together on. Um, and I'd like to finish with a quote from Asher from the uh, Ocean Leaders thing, which um, probably is a quote everyone else has had, which is, uh, talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. And if we're going to say partnership, then we have to make sure those opportunities are for all. So for me, those are the kind of messages I've taken home. Thank you very much, Angela. And you're not speaking too long when they're sort of interesting and wise words and, and good ideas there. So we're really kind of at the end of the session. And, uh, and I know that uh, Katya Mathis wanted to give a few last words. Um, I wanted to thank all the panelists very much for the perspectives. I have learned a lot. And I think that, you know, uh, from a Goose perspective, we have some great, um, great programs and some great opportunities under the Ocean Decade, but we're also missing a few key pieces. And uh, 
in terms of supporting um, big ocean states towards this development. And I, I really look forward to, to working with the large ocean institutes as well as the big ocean states towards solving some of the, the key issues that have been brought up today um, in an in a integrated and, and holistic way. So thank you very much, panelists. Okay, so um, after Margaret has opened the session with a nice view on the history of Scripps and Geomar, I'm happy to conclude and close the session um, with a very positive view into the future because I think we can really use the UN Ocean Decade to move forward and uh, to go together um, for a sustained ocean observing um, system. So let me, let me say a few closing words. Um, many challenges face the ocean and the planet today in the realms of climate change, fisheries, energy and mineral resources, biodiversity, human health, pollution and more. Solution to these challenges will come from a deeper understanding of the ocean, its dynamics and vulnerabilities. At the beginning of science is discovery, systematic observation and measurement. Observations are initially driven by curiosity to understand the environment, biodiversity, climate or the ocean. Observations of ocean physics, biogeochemistry, marine life, human interactions and disturbances underpin the ability to effectively benefit from and conserve the ocean. However, if the overall system is to be understood, the observation systems should also be globally networked. This is not possible without international cooperation in science, for example, through the programs supported by the International Science Council and UN organizations. We have agreed on working together under the decade for ocean science. Ocean observing has tackled integration of disciplines and communities. Technological innovation, general, generational shifts in ocean leadership and improved access, equity and capacity for many nations. We heard the voices of many perspectives on ocean observing needs with particular emphasis on island nations and I'm very thankful um, that you took the time to, to come here and give your perspective. We thank you, Ambassador Ronald Jumeau from the Seychelles and Corinne for stepping in for the Ocean Ministry of Cabo Verde. To give us your insights as representatives of small island states, you and others emphasized the progress made and identified needs, opportunities and priority actions going forward. Thank you for your evaluations and perspectives. We, as representatives of key ocean observing institutions, Scripps, Ivremer, NOC, Woods Hole, Geomar, will work together to address these needs. And I would like to refer to the political declaration of this fantastic UN Ocean Conference this week, point 14a, summarizes exactly the topics we discussed here. And I think we directors of institutions focusing on global ocean observing in many aspects, we agree on the conference commitment, and I cite, to taking the following science-based and innovative actions on an urgent basis, recognizing that developing countries, in particular small island states, face capacity challenges that need to be addressed. We will work together on, as it is written out in the political declaration, and I say, say it again, strengthen international, regional, sub-regional and national scientific systematic observation and data collection efforts, including of environmental and socio-economic data, especially in developing countries, and improve the timely sharing and dissemination of data and knowledge. 
including by making data widely accessible through open access databases, investing in national statistical systems, standardizing data, ensuring interoperability between databases, and synthesizing data into information for policy and decision makers, and support capacity building in developing countries to improve data collection and analysis. Finally, I would like to thank all the speakers again and all the directors for coming here, in particular Lisa and Toste for initiating this joint event and for putting together the excellent panel. Um, I would like to thank Rob Monroe from Scripps and Nicole Kostner from Geomar for taking on the logistics of this um, event, and particularly Nicole for stepping in on very short notice. Um, I thank Emma for the moderation um, of the panel and everyone else involved in making this side event um, happening and so successful. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the partnerships to come and to a sustained ocean observing system. Thank you. <laughs>